MI Cynic, the podcast with a license to inform. This is your host, Thomas Brancato. Today, I have the honor of inviting Dr. Maria Albano, somebody who's had a lot of presentations regarding uh, a number of topics and public speaker and somebody who I'm very honored to have uh, today. But without Spoiling too much, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marie Alvenu and maybe just ask you to very briefly explain a little bit about what, you, what you're doing right now and uh, some of the past projects that you've been involved in. So, hello, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, I love being here. It is my first time uh, doing the podcast, so uh, I think it's going to be a fine experience. Uh, thank you also for the presentation and the nice words. Um, I'm a criminologist, so I deal mainly, uh, as the name says it, with crime. I focus uh, all these years sort of mainly on terrorism, extremist violence. Starting from this point of view, um, to me, it was quite interesting to see the dynamics of uh, hate and violence that seemed to start uh, with the corona crisis. And currently I'm part of a working group called COVID-19 Viral Violence. Uh, there are also two other colleagues, one sociologist and one anthropologist. And each one of us has looked into the phenomenon of violence uh, occurring in this period from different aspects. Uh, my main concern was interpersonal violence and violence um, perpetrated um, towards or against, I would say, targets that are related to the state and also from state actors and agencies like the police against citizens. So it's a vast subject, um, but I found it very interesting because um, the corona situation was something new. And all of a sudden, it was not just a medical emergency, but it was something that began to be translated also into the behavior of everyday people. It was a challenge to see how these behaviors showed a dynamic to violence. And again, uh, I, think, I think my first uh, interest and instinct to this situation was um, to see how all the uh, new laws and measures uh, regarding uh, you know, fighting the coronavirus would uh, influence a human behavior and the relationship between state and citizen. The first part of what I'd like to talk about actually related to the last episode of this podcast uh, regarding to Afghanistan. And uh, I say this because your work uh, frequently touches on hate crimes, discrimination, anti-quality, and uh, mental health. Um, these are things that you look at uh, during your work quite often. And we could say marginalized groups, more broadly speaking, is something that you, you take a look at. And this also relates back to Afghanistan in, in many ways, specifically uh, to a leadership program that you did in February of this year called Afghans for Progressive Thinking. And since that time, of course, President Biden has announced the withdrawal of all US armed forces. Uh, I've had uh, just recently an interview with uh, Irfan Yar, an expert on Afghanistan, and we talked about a lot of things. But we didn't talk much about this, about the marginalized groups uh, within Afghanistan and about the nature of the conflict there. So a question that I have is for you, since uh, you delivered that, that presentation, what is your view now on the background of the conflict between the tribal and the political groups in Afghanistan and perhaps what you see going forwards in as far as marginalization? Well, you're touching uh, a very deep subject, and Afghanistan is an area that interests me a lot. Uh, I have been doing also mentoring uh, with, uh, with an organization that is helping Afghan girls, and um, it touches a lot my, my criminological interests and my interest uh, in terrorism, radicalization to violence. Um, I would say that, um, especially due to the recent attacks, um, any um, form of um, hope that seemed to be built uh, now is a bit, you know, uh, we are in shaky grounds. Um, and my communication with uh, the youth of Afghanistan, what shows me is that indeed there is a lot of desperation. 
You mentioned mar- marginalized groups. I think that the problem in Afghanistan is the underlying conflict at the presence of people who are in the extreme side of their ideology slash religion. I'm not saying that religion is a problem. I'm saying that this extreme side and interpretation uh, of, of religion and cultural norms is, is a, a danger for security. Um, and although one wants to be an optimist, um, you know, the feedback that I had uh, also during my presentation was that, yes, okay, all these uh, advice coming from the West about trying to find a common line, um, trying uh, to enforce uh, principles of mediation, again, you know, trying to find the best interest and communicating with the other side. Do they work in our environment? And of course, as a scholar and in principle, you try to find ways to uh, convince people that, yes, the principles of peace and mediation can apply. However, reality uh, often shows that this is hard to achieve. And Afghanistan is an example of how hard it is to achieve peace and how uh, certain groups are indeed using violence and are very much uh, planning to continue using this violence. And and it seems like um, the youth of Afghanistan that wants a different future, that wants a future without violence, wants a future with progress, um, do not find solutions. And of course, the outside powers, US, and generally I would say uh, the way that uh, Western countries have seen the Afghan situation doesn't seem to help in the sense that for all this time that Western influence was in the area, it seems like, well, unfortunately, I have to say this, institutions were not built in a way that can keep, sustain, make, develop, you know, uh, a piece that will, will, will stay and stand. This is, this is what I say. Radicalization to violence is there. And my problem is that the youth that doesn't want this radicalization and wants peace doesn't seem to have a venue to pursue this way. Just to provide a bit of balance, because the last time I spoke in Afghanistan, unfortunately, a lot of the um, a lot of the discussion was um, negative, for lack of a better word, or certainly didn't include much talk about tangible steps on how we we can improve and rebuild the great nation of Afghanistan. And so, to that end, I did want to ask you, because I know you work very closely with this, is can you point to any positive uh, steps or any any examples of where we can combat extremism and we can make the future better for girls in Afghanistan and and the youth more broadly speaking? Empowerment of women is always uh, a great step and giving opportunities. And this is something that, to be honest, I see that the West is trying uh, to help with. For example, there are scholarships, there are programs for girls uh, in Afghanistan to go study abroad. The thing is, um, how many of these girls are going to return back to Afghanistan in order to be part of this you know, changing force for the country, because when all these problems are present there, um, the moment that you have a chance to leave this place, the moment that you have a chance to have a better future, I doubt whether you're going to return there and subject your life and your family even into the danger of, uh, you know, new bombing and losing your life. So, uh, yes, empowering women is uh, a step. We see lots of programs um, like that, uh, education for women. Um, However, uh, let's not, I mean, this is why I have lost a bit of my optimism in the sense that unless there is a way to combat also the tribes that use violence, and here it is a security, it's definitely a security issue with a strict sense, all the other uh, steps, which of course are positive, may not be that effective. Um, I know girls, I have uh, contacts in Afghanistan, girls who get educated, who will live or live now uh, in the United States. Will they return? Should they return? I mean, someone is is thinking also about this. The role of women generally in society, the moment that we have progression and development in that area, usually also society begins to be more inclusive. On the other hand, those tribes who have all these fundamentalist ideas, the minute they see moves like this, it's when they they decide to act more because they want to protect the status that they know.
Right, and, and that's where it, the, the politics and the religious extremism gets involved in it all. What did the West do until now? I mean, let's count the years that we have all this foreign influence in Afghanistan. What is the result? Well, I think one of the things that I was speaking with Irfan Yar in Afghanistan is that after 20 years, we're talking about a country that's, you know, barely managed to get its foot on the ground in as far as its democracy, in its institutions, its democracy, and uh, a very high likelihood that we will actually be seeing the return of tribal political violence and factionalism. So 20 years afterwards, it's even worse, you might argue. Yes, and it, it means that the whole procedure and the whole plan about Afghanistan doesn't seem to be very successful at the end of the day. And, you know, measuring the results, as you put it, it's 20 years, 20 years, well, 25 years, I think we measure a generation. So 20 years is a lot of time. And I find it interesting when you mention a lot of the steps that we are taking in the West include uh, Afghani men, women, uh, younger coming to the Western countries, get an education perhaps, and then they don't want to return. This is, of course, a, a challenge in, in, in its own right in finding the, the solution to that. But for now, I find it interesting what kind of a West they will be coming to, because that West is now a very different West. Uh, coronavirus has, of course, had a, a massive impact on the world as we knew it, and, uh, and here in, in the uh, so-called first world, so-called Western world as well. You talk a little bit about corona crime and the corona criminals, two terms that I like very much uh, from some of your recent work. And uh, I want to take a moment here just to discuss a little bit about what this means. What is a corona crime? What is a coronal criminal? And how do we police this? Well, the whole idea started with something that, uh, I mean, the first lesson that we teach in criminology and even criminal law is what is a crime? And yes, there is this legalistic approach that crime is whatever is prohibited by law. However, um, crime is also a social construction. And in order for the punishment of crime to have also some legitimacy inside society, this notion of crime should equal a, a very, let's say, um, antisocial behavior. And to the average person, to be honest, this antisocial behavior usually equates to violence. So let's think not as criminologists, not as experts in crime, but as the average person. Listening to the word criminal or crime, rape, homicide, uh, burglary, all these things come to mind. Okay. So um, let's say administrative laws that prohibit certain kinds of behavior do not come to mind. So for example, I will use uh, case studies from Greek reality, but I expect that uh, people can uh, relate also with examples from their own countries. So there are some administrative laws in Greece that uh, regard uh, how loud you can have your music uh, and there are some administrative you know, punishments about that. Or when you are uh, parking somewhere where you should not park and of course you get a ticket. And this is unlawful in the general sense, but it's not a crime in the sense that we would speak about it in criminology. So we know that criminal and, uh, and crime are a person who shows very intense antisocial behavior, usually violence, and crime is the equivalent behavior. And this is what the average person understands. And more or less, the criminal is the bad guy generalization, I know a, a, a label, I know, but this is how the average person understands it. And I think that partly uh, this relates also to, to reality. However, today with the corona crime and the corona criminal, we have a situation where people that, you know, before the corona uh, crisis would never consider that they would have any issue with the law definitely they were not the target group of policemen, are now in their focus. So when you have police officers running around old ladies who insist to go in church because church service is suspended and they get fined, so they get arrested and um, laws that, you know, they are very general and they speak about endangerment are applied. 
then you see this um, new form of criminal, a new form of, of crime. And police officers were used to um, hunting down hardcore criminals, uh, violent people, and now they find themselves arguing with an old lady or arguing with the person that doesn't want to wear a mask. Uh, I think that this this is a new reality for uh, law enforcement, and it is also a new reality for criminology. We have to see the development of crime in a new way. As well, not only just, uh, as you mentioned, the example of perhaps of an old lady, an innocent old lady going to church, but uh, also what's certainly been the case here in the United Kingdom, but also in the United States, mass demonstrations related or unrelated to COVID-19, such as uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, but uh, many others as well. Uh, we've seen mass uh, public gatherings, sometimes quite blatantly breaking uh, the COVID-19 regulations. And we've also seen, on the other hand, the excessive use of police force. How do we address them within the framework of our existing rule of law and is it adequate? There is a, a very thin line uh, between using the force of law as we should and uh, abusing it. Um, it is generally a very sensitive issue. I do understand uh, countries and their governments and I do understand also the first phase of surprise because in the first wave of, of COVID-19, to be honest, no one knew what was going on. Uh, we didn't know the, um, the ways of transmission and the extent that a certain behavior could have um, in transmitting the virus. So a lot of um, prohibitions <laughs> came into place. And breaking them seemed to be, I mean, in the beginning, you didn't know whether uh, breaking a certain measure uh, really uh, meant transmitting the virus. Now, we have had some clear-cut COVID crimes. Like if you remember in the first phase uh, in China, there were some people who were spitting and touching the buttons of, of elevators. There were images like this with people trying to spread the virus. So yes, here you have a behavior that is antisocial and is aiming into harming someone through the virus. However, uh, in the cases that you mentioned, even when you had um, demonstrations, meetings, I don't think that the scope of the people was to spread the virus. In many cases, uh, I have seen in demonstrations, even people wearing masks or keeping distances. And I'm saying it's a sensitive case because um, there were some demonstrations that took place not because of COVID, uh, not, not against COVID measures, but because of other things that were happening in societies. And people went out to demonstrate and push their governments to take up, you know, different measures. Should we put all these on hold? Should we put democracy on hold with, should I use the word excuse? I don't like the word excuse because with excuse, we, we mean that we have another target and we just, you know, use COVID-19 as an excuse. Um, should COVID-19 serve as a reason to put all life on hold? And especially when the laws that we have been applying are laws that speak vaguely about endangerment and there doesn't seem to be a clear connection with transmission. I don't know. And I find it very interesting, uh, Maria, how many authoritarian governments around the world don't even have to ask themselves this question. I mean, for countries like the United Kingdom, Greece, United States, uh, you know, this is such an important... Do we put democracy on hold? And, and how on earth do we do that legally? Because, you know, we have very firmly entrenched systems to prevent uh, taking, uh, you know, radical measures uh, from one day to the next. And usually these are these are very controlled procedures, such as, um, you know, passing emergency uh, regulations uh, declaring an emergency state. Other countries like Russia and China, maybe, um, you know, they either don't have these systems in place or they, they don't really care too much about them. And their response to COVID has been, uh, you, you could even argue, a, a lot quicker, if not necessarily a lot more effective. I think that's a separate question. Great point. But um, let me share here a small, not objection, but, um, you know, generally about crime, we can say that about normal criminality, countries that have all this tough approach have lower percentages. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, yes, if you lock all people in their homes, definitely you're not going to have crime on the streets, but is it a price you want to pay? And I think that in the UK, because you mentioned UK, and for me, um, 
part of the problem was not measures having to do with the spread of the virus, but measures that had to do with disciplining people. Like I never understood why in countries like Greece, the point was not whether you should exit ho- your home or not, but sending the SMS to the competent authority and um, writing all those self-certification of forms in order to be out. So if you send an SMS, the virus doesn't uh, transmit, but you know, uh, if you don't send it, it transmits. These things that had to do with certain ways that the measures were enforced, I think this was a problem, and it was in other countries too. While in the UK, um, I think that um, although, yes, there was a discussion about the measures, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there were also a prominent figures like Lord Sumption that raised objections about the whole situation. I believe that people had more of a say and they were more um, able to, at least this was my, my, my perception, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, they were more um, allowed to exercise their freedoms during this period. I would certainly agree with you on that one. I think a generalization that can be made is that it took a longer st- time for uh, the established Western democracies to adapt uh, to the challenge. But now, you know, one year into this, we can clearly see that, you know, with the vaccine rollouts in particular, um, we're catching up quickly and uh, making a lot more progress. But I do think that compared with other regimes, like China was able to pretty much isolate and quarantine large cities like Wuhan uh, very quickly on. However, I'm not sure how they're doing now. I haven't read the latest reports. I'm not sure if I trust the latest reports coming from China because a lot of the official communication seems to suggest that uh, the crisis is over in China. But uh, I don't know if this if this is true. Um, what I can say, though, is that in the United Kingdom's case, it has taken it was an awkward process. Um, to get everything legally, socially and policing wise. Now, especially, is a very weird time because, you know, we've come pre-vaccine from a time in which it was common in the news to be corona shaming. And uh, you'd have, you know, a, a university student having a party at, and and being fined uh, large, you know, up to £10,000. Um, and that being displayed on the news and there was a great... There were, you know, social case, There was a social demonstration made of it on the on the news channels, and uh, I haven't heard much of that lately on the news. I think now, as we're nearing a higher threshold of the population being uh, vaccinated, it's you know suddenly less uh, worrying uh, that uh, people are perhaps infringing these rules. Um, although uh, I couldn't say for certain. People showed their behavior and they showed uh, who they are during this period. I mean, uh, you mentioned Corona parties and yes, people showed, some people showed how much they have disregard of public health and of the health of others. I mean, they did not think of any consequence uh, starting from their behavior. And yes, this was also evident in other countries. Other people showed this over zealous, let's say, behavior of uh, denouncing others to the authorities. A lot of issues uh, to press. And, you know, about this denouncement and the, this uh, zealous behavior, it amazes me that, uh, well, we know that domestic violence, for example, is something that troubles societies. Well, in my career, I have never seen this zealous behavior to denounce your neighbor for beating up his wife. But I, th- I saw this zeal and, you know, uh, denouncing your neighbor because you thought he was or she was breaking the corona measures. Uh, this has been a period that definitely we have seen attitudes that we're, go- we're going to discuss about this for, for years, I believe, in criminology. Very interesting. I think as well, what we have seen through COVID-19 is that this implications for racial and social discrimination aren't just something that happens far away in the third world, like Afghanistan that we've mentioned before, but something that's very close to home. Uh, sorry, but because you mentioned it, I'm really curious at one point to see whether researchers can see how those societies dealt with COVID-19, not from a legal point of view, inside the society, and how did our societies dealt with it? Because this would be quite interesting to see, regardless of other problems, whether social bonds uh, in, in such, let's say, more traditional societies uh, may have worked 
better or worse for for handling the corona crisis what's been in your opinion have you seen any evidence or response to covid-19 spilling also into racial and social discrimination has this happened here Well, in Europe, there have been cases that have been uh, international human rights organizations that have raised concerns, for example, about how policing could be uh, more targeting people like Roma or refugees, um, generally foreigners. Definitely, uh, I think that this was quite evident even in the first phase of uh, COVID-19, that uh, people of Asian heritage or Asian looking were uh, targeted and they were victims of crime, crime that was related to hate. And I think this had to do again with the narrative of fighting COVID-19, the invisible enemy. And, you know, people don't like invisible things. They like very visible targets. And all this invisible would become visible and very visible to the scapegoat That would be the Asian-looking person that is carrying the virus. Let's not forget that in the beginning, there were people who were talking about the Chinese virus. Let's not forget that. It even got a political um, hue. Uh, so I would say that definitely there was this racial aspect, uh, the negative uh, aspect and, and violence. Another group, of course, large group that uh, has seen the effects of COVID-19 in a, in a negative way is, is women. And uh, this is something that you've spoken about. But I, I've got uh, just a quote here that uh, w when I was doing research for our interview, made me raise my eyes because I never knew uh, that we were talking about uh, something as large as this. But uh, I'll just read it out to you. The World Health Organization reports that one in three women globally are subjected to violence and younger women are more at risk. One in three. Violence against women is endemic in every country and culture, causing harm to millions of women and their families and has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. This was said by Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, uh, the Director General of The WHO. Now, this is uh, very important to analyze from very d many different angles, but specifically today I want to be talking about Uh, how it relates to COVID-19, the last part of, of this quote. And this is something I don't fully understand, and I'm hoping maybe you can shed a bit of light, is what exactly is the link between a pandemic or, say, financial hardship, natural disasters, and domestic abuse? Well, let's start with saying that um, men don't beat up their wives because of COVID-19. <laughs> so uh, the relationship between the pandemic and the phenomenon that you just mentioned is that the pandemic created very fertile um, ground for this behavior to be to be carried out more often and especially for women not to be able to find protection. Very simple things, okay? Um, how can you leave your home when there is a curfew? How can you leave your home when you're afraid that if you take your children and leave home, you don't have anywhere to go And this anywhere is a place that is uh, COVID free and, you know, uh, safe uh, in order for you and your children not to contract uh, the virus. So generally we have a problem with women having uh, difficulty to get out of home when they are abused. Now, imagine this being reinforced when you're in a COVID situation. Women who have the dilemma stay at home and die probably because of, uh, you know, being beaten up or uh, live with my children and contract the virus and die or endanger my children because I will expose them to that danger. So let's get, uh, I mean, this first situation. The second one, women who don't have the possibility to communicate with others, and this doesn't, doesn't mean just that they will not have moral, psychological support of their friends or their families who will see them, who will see the bruise in their eyes, who will understand that something is going on, but they will not have also this support at court because they will not have witnesses. We know in uh, domestic abuse cases now that we have witnesses, friends against, again, or relatives who will come in court and say, yes, I saw her with a bruised eye. Yes, I saw her with bruises over her body or any other sign of of uh, of hurt when these women you know for for a very big periods for months didn't have any communication with the outside world how could they show these signs uh, 
How could they communicate even with phone or, you know, Zoom and other ways when uh, they are at the same home with their abuser who could have taken their phone or they could not phone and communicate in the presence of their abuser? So there was this practical, I would say, aspects that authorities in, in many countries did not think of in the beginning. The chance of women to go out and, and reach for help and also reach for legal help and assistance. And in many cases, uh, in countries, uh, courts did not operate the same uh, speed and in the same way that they operated in pre-COVID circumstances. So a lot of procedures were put on hold. Women did not have free access to lawyer because generally meeting outside home was prohibited and there were a lot of obstacles. Not being able to have legal assistance is also a problem when you want to denounce your abuser and want to have the best strategy to combat this phenomenon, to save your life and uh, also guard your children. These were issues that, um, yes, made, made domestic abuse more easy. I don't know if it is more often because generally with the statistics and domestic abuse, we have problems. We have dark number. We don't know how large dark number can be. And dark number means the cases that are not denounced for many reasons. I think that one of the positive things is that because of quotes like the ones uh, you mentioned, people started to think more about domestic abuse. And I think it's a, an incredibly important thing to be talking about and be thinking about. And that's why I, I want to give you the platform today to, to speak about this. We only be thinking about it after COVID-19. This is a question that uh, bothers me. And also some of the positions that I have seen, and unfortunately, even from people who are in the spotlight, um, who actually connected domestic abuse with, with being frustrated from the situation of the measures. So it's like men are frustrated because they had to stay at home and they beat up their wives. And it doesn't work this way. <laughs> or advice like uh, take a walk or even break the measures uh, if it will help you not to beat up your wife. So uh, it's like the solution uh, to domestic abuse is a man taking a walk. It's simplistic. What I found staggering and outrageous, uh, really, is that the problem is not COVID itself, but rather that our response to COVID has been, you know, to keep more people at home, lessen uh, chances for women to uh, to be able to report the crimes or talk, or have a network, speak to people. So in a way, what we're saying is that it's not COVID itself, but a problem that is, is already in our environment, is endemic in our environment. And I think if there was a, if it was a depressing realization, it would have to be that. Sorry to, to, sorry to interrupt, but because you have mentioned Afghanistan a lot of times, and for many people, this area of the world is like, you know, the world that is not progressive and the world that women face problems. And I think COVID-19 brought into service the fact that women get victimized in very modern and developed countries. And I think this was shocking to some people too. It doesn't happen to Afghanistan. It doesn't happen to Saudi Arabia. Yes, it happens to the UK. It happens to Spain. It happens to Italy. It happens to Greece. And the more important realization is that it will continue to happen after COVID. So yeah. what, what can we learn from this? And what can governments do from a legal perspective to help women now under this extreme situation in COVID and afterwards when COVID hopefully is behind us? In many countries, I would say that the problem is not legal in the sense that uh, pro-COVID period, in, in pro -COVID, uh, pre COVID period, the measures and the legislation was drafted in ways that theoretically there are ways for women to denounce their abuser. The problem here lies more uh, with society, stereotyping. I mean, if, if, we, if we move on from the COVID period that yes, we know that there, is, there are those standard situations that we mentioned before, but uh, I believe that we are moving uh, into a new phase. Um, there are no more restrictions in many countries or they are uh, getting more easy. So women will have access again in, into social life. So the question is, how can we battle? How can we uh, tackle this phenomenon? And I think that we should, uh, we should start with society. There are still stereotypes. 
Um, there are still problems with women being able to stand on their own feet, being uh, independent financially, um, being able to carry out their lives without having to achieve goals that society wants them to achieve. And I'm saying this because in my legal uh, career, I have seen women that were very hesitant to leave their abuser. You know why? They would say to me, I don't want to disappoint my family. I don't want to show, I don't want to feel that uh, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, because society wants me to be a perfect woman, which means, you know, I didn't, I didn't ruin my family. I didn't, I was not a failure. I'm not alone. I mean, even today, let's, let's be realistic. How many companies will give a job to a woman who is 50 and who has spent her life in her household and is going out to become part of the workforce now? Nothing, zero. Yeah, yeah zero. Okay. How many chances uh, are for a woman to rebuild her life or let me put it another way. Uh, is it the same for men and women when they are, you know, breaking a relationship and going out again into the dating world? Even this. I mean, I do know women that feel this anxiety to be with someone because they feel that society equates this with success. And yes, they are afraid to stay alone. They are afraid to disappoint their families. Again, you know, the family card, at least in some countries where traditional roles still apply, uh, the family card is a strong one. And unfortunately, I have to say this, from my legal experience, I have met also parents who would advise their uh, daughters not to leave their husbands. They would say, we will not take you back into the family house. We will not support you because, you know, you left family home. You have now your family. You will not disgrace us. And these no, excuse me, they don't happen to Iran or Saudi Arabia. They can happen into very, very much European uh, societies still today. Well, I think there's a lot of work to do then in combating these stereotypes. And um, specifically, I was interested by your point on networks and how important these are for, for women to be in networks, whereby you have an outlet that people can see if your face is bruised, people can see if you're having a hardship. I think this is one of the crucial things that during COVID-19, uh, governments, civil societies, NGOs, whatever it is, concerned citizens can step in and in strengthen and improve those networks maybe with technology and um, I think what that hopefully might lead to should lead to is a culture of reporting where we change our social vision for a brave woman is a woman that reports uh, and and switch around the stereotype on its head by saying actually it's you know it's the other way around a good mother a good wife whatever you want to call it is one that reports and and shows her her daughters and her children, the braveness that it that that entails, and and makes a positive step in the future. Do you think there's a role to be played there from a technological, legal, social perspective to improve those networks? Definitely, I think that technology, uh, of course, as we said before, okay, if you're living with your abuser, he can take your phone, okay, and the phone, the the, the laptop, the tablet has been a window to to the world during this period. Okay, it was a window to the world. It was a means of communication. But generally, technology has helped. Uh, it can definitely give you the opportunity to network, to denounce, to show things. Um, and it can bring dom a domestic situation in the public sphere. You know, another problem with domestic abuse is actually the adjective domestic and the whole narrative that makes all this situation an issue of the whole house of, of the domestic sphere. Um, I think at one point we must name it in another way. It's not a domestic abuse. It's an abuse that, yes, uh, from a location point of view uh, can happen inside the home, but it is a public issue. And by the way, uh, I have seen uh, women being uh, abused by their husbands on broad daylight and in the street. Okay, not, not even in a location that was the home. But still people perceived this as a domestic issue that they should not interfere. So they would not denounce, they would not, uh, they would not carry out any act that would show interest because this was perceived, as I said before, an issue of the family, a family matter. Uh, and networking, I think, today and technology can help us with communication to 
overcome this. From the point of legislation, uh, I will insist that most countries have uh, have a good legislation. They have a good piece of law there that, if applied, it can have results. But is it applied? Even judges, we we read in in uh, legal journals cases where even judges have been hesitant because. Again, the perception of the family matter is, uh, is, is prevailing, I think, in, in many cases. We have to overcome this. I think it's a, it's a systemic change and it's a cultural change and it's a change of stereotypes. And uh, hopefully uh, when the world comes out of COVID-19, we can take those lessons forward and understand what women need to be protected. And it's going to be an effort on everybody's part. We know that there is also male victimization, and in male victimization, in, in domestic abuse, things are even more hard because the male stereotype of a strong man who should not complain, of course, for being, uh, you know, abused by his wife. This is also a problem. It is a problem when uh, you hear of police officers laughing when someone is denouncing that he has been hit by his wife, and it's it's perceived as a joke. How would you feel as a man if you would go to denounce your victimization and you would be, uh, you know, treated like a joke? So it almost seems to me like so much of, of this dark reporting, of this lack of reporting, of this uh, pervasiveness of discrimination and abuse, it all comes back down really to these these strong stereotypes that we have of, of our roles within a, a traditional family setting and how damaging these are. It's, it's interesting because when they're taught to children around the world, usually followed with a religious imagery, they tend to be so kind. Oh, Adam and Eve and the big tree and the farm and the sheep. But uh, the, there is so much pain behind these traditional roles. And it seems to me from our conversation that that is the first place we should be looking at uh, freeing people uh, from these perceptions. I'm not sure whether it is, though. Um, I mean, patriarchy definitely plays a role. And it plays a role because domestic abuse is an issue of power. And the violence that has been exercised is a violence that has been exercised as a means of power. And there is also dehumanization, uh, the, the, the dignity and the, uh, the value of women is not perceived in the same way like a, a, of, of a man's. But I think that we have seen violence take place also in families of non-conventional and traditional forms. So I think that uh, we could say that patriarchy, in a sense, has transcended and has even um, gone overboard. And it has, it has had an effect also in forms of family or union where you don't have traditional role. It's a big issue. It seems like it's not a black and white thing, uh, Dr. Alvenu, and that uh, uh, perhaps I was mistaken to think we could just trace this back to uh, the traditional uh, uh, patriarchy. You're saying that it has it has developed a lot. It's not just in the traditional forms. You're right about the traditional forms. You're right also about the traditional roles. And they have affected a lot also the way that women um, react. I mean, the way that women see their future and their place and... In some cases, I have to tell you, I was, as a lawyer, um, startled with hearing women not understanding that being abused was victimization because they considered it as something natural, because it is something that they saw happening to their mothers, happening to their grandmothers, and they considered that part of family life is also to be slapped in the face. Okay, it's not a big deal. The constant um, efforts of, of the man to, to steal, to rob a woman from her dignity was not perceived as something strange. And because you mentioned networking, uh, one of the steps that has not been uh, highlighted enough, and it is a step that usually ab abusers take before the actual physical victimization, is cutting, cutting the networking, cutting the network, cutting any support net uh, around the person. So we see a systematic effort to stop any communication of the wife with her family and her friends because she has no network of support. Well, it seems to me that uh, this is a a far-reaching problem and uh, it goes back all the way to the to the very heart the very root of humanity 
if COVID will not wake up the world to the abuse and the pain and uh, the inequality and the discrimination of marginalized groups, what will? How do we get there? Well, um, if we see cases uh, in countries like, and we see definitely, unfortunately, we see cases in Turkey, cases um, in Europe, in a more rare percentage, but, but we do see them also, cases that end up in blood. And recently in Greece, we had a case like that. I think, unfortunately, societies seem to wake up when it's too late for certain people, when they see cases that ended in death, when they see cases that ended up uh, also in a woman, um, you know, at a stage even uh, killing her husband in self-defense. Uh, cases that end up in tragedies like this uh, seem to wake up people. But I hope that they would wake up before such tragedies happen, because once these tragedies happen, they, they open wounds that uh, are not easily closed. Hmm. I want to turn our attention briefly to policing, uh, because that seems to me just as an important part of the equation as the victim. We also have to talk about how we protect and often uh, how we uh, policing makes worse a situation. Um, but. Lately, there's been new developments on this front, and you talk about uh, uh, community policing as an emerging trend. Would you get to explain to me a little bit what, what is community policing and what does it change about policing up until now? Well, I have not dealt actually uh, with community uh, policing a lot. It is a trend that we see in several countries. The, the whole idea behind it, the principle is of police becoming let's say, uh, a more active part of society, not something that is on a different level. Um, I would say that for the phenomenon that we are talking about, on a legal sphere and in parts of, of uh, from the part of organizing the police, the fact that women have become parts of the law enforcement has helped a lot. And it has helped a lot because women can have experience and they can have also a way to come closer to victims and um, help them with, with uh, pursuing their case and with denouncing uh, their case. If we're talking also about community policing generally uh, regarding crime and regarding the minority issues that we have uh, mentioned, again, we will see that um, moves like recruitment to the police for members of different uh, groups in the society, ethnic, racial, religious, also has been a very good step. Now I'm talking generally, not just about uh, COVID-19 or uh, about domestic abuse. Uh, community policing and community police would be a policeman on the street, but more as perceived, acting and perceived by the society as a member of the community and not as someone who is, uh, let's say, from an outside circle. And then it goes back also to principles of collaboration with the citizens and with the smaller communities that may exist uh, in a city, let's say, for example. I think it is a bright idea. Uh, more we will see it being enforced in Anglo-Saxon countries, but there have been also steps uh, taken uh, in continental Europe. I'm not hesitant at all. Uh, it's just that in certain countries, um, the relationship between police and citizens has been forged also through the centuries and through years that, well, in some countries, the governing regimes have used police in a certain way. Um, and this has a bit influenced the perception of people towards the police. So. In countries where you have had a dictatorship in the past, and we have European countries that have had dictatorships in the past. Um, and when I say in the past, I'm not talking about, you know, 300 years ago. I'm talking about modern times. To build the whole model of community policing and to forge this new relationship between citizens and police uh, is still a bit of a challenge, or let's say it can be a challenge. So we've talked a bit about discrimination and uh, domestic abuse. And if we add as well uh, human rights abuses and hate crimes, 
how do these relate back to terrorism and will we see a rise of this in the future oh great great question great question because uh in a sense a lot of terrorist activity could also be a hate crime because in hate crime you have crime that is it has nothing to do with hate as an emotion uh you know fighting with someone and saying i hate you no it's not an emotional situation when we're talking about hate crimes we're talking about an ideology a systematic let's say um negative approach towards people of a certain alternative characteristic and uh in many cases yes terrorism can echo also that behavior uh of course in terrorism we have to have also the element of the behavior causing terror and trying to push a government to do or not to do something so there is this coercion element too um but the basis can be uh, an ideology of hate and well if we're talking about islamist terrorism for example yes of course there is this ideology of hate but we see that ideology of hate also let's say in far right or far uh, left terrorism too where in the far left any member of the establishment is considered uh, as a legitimate target and less than human and at the same time we were talking about far right islamophobic terrorism again yes uh, there can be hate ideology against muslims with tensions with this whole situation of covid that has brought into surface tension and unfortunately for me uh, a problem of covid-19 has been that it brought the far right into the surface a lot it has given the opportunity of radicalization online a lot because people were stuck at home and the only means of communication and entertainment and of anything i mean you would do you would do it online uh people were online people came into contact with theories of conspiracy with far right rhetoric the far right has played the card of and this was very bizarre actually in exemora uh because far right presented itself then advocated and uh, used propaganda to show itself as you know protector of freedoms which is of course an exemora and it doesn't stand but because people were frustrated by governments and their measures the far right found this void and filled it so i think that in the future we're going to see a conflict uh, especially because this polarization seemed to help uh, the far right i don't know in what level this will be um, translated in in forms of terrorism uh, a lot of things have been going on uh, this last period i mean if we're talking about terrorism uh, if you read certain um, articles today uh, especially after what is going on in the middle east there are a lot of predictions about um, terrorism uh, we will see how this dynamic will go but definitely hate crimes definitely um being negative ex- uh, wanting to exclude from society certain groups because of their alternative characteristics is a basis for um extremist behavior mm-hmm. well one of the common factors that uh, we've been uh, about all these issues that we've been talking today is dehumanization i find this word really interesting and it's popped up a few times in our conversation today and i want to stop just a moment to consider that because i think it's a uh, fundamental that we understand that if we are to understand uh, the root causes of the rest and in as far as that goes i wonder how we can relate it back to the presentations and what you've learned at the uh, INADR mediation tournament this year in Tbilisi Georgia i wonder if dehumanization is ever a part of what you do as mediators and how it it shows up what what link there is between combating uh, dehumanization and bringing two parties into a successful resolution is there a link there Well, dehumanization uh of course it's a negative uh notion but it's a favorite one of mine i have used it uh during my phd research i use it generally it's it's a standard for criminologists because you're able actually to commit any kind of crime the moment you dehumanize the other which means the moment you um remove human characteristics human dignity your perception of the other as 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 a human being so Let me give you an example. We try to find and this is also a human mechanism. We try to find excuses, we, we try to find reasons, we try to find justifications for our behavior and on a subconscious level 
uh, when we don't treat the other person as equal as another human being, this is dehumanization and it gives us a chance to commit crimes and even horrendous crimes. I mean, um, the basic research and theory behind dehumanization had to do and brought examples of what happened with concentration camps and uh, the behavior of Nazis against the Jews. It, it is the ultimate, let's say, example of uh, the worst form of dehumanization. Uh, but apart from this very specific case, as I said before, uh, in a smaller or larger scale, uh, people who commit crimes dehumanize uh, the victim. And rehumanization is something that we attempt to do also when we mediate. So we try to make the two parts. Think of the other part as, as of equal um, value, of human value. If you and I have a difference, and I consider you of a lesser value, of, of less of a human. So you don't have the, the same rights like I do on that case. We will never find a solution. We will never find a viable solution. So it is indeed a principle that uh, we learn to use. And it has to do also with understanding. Well, empathy may be a very strong word, but we need a level of empathy. And empathy is part of you cannot be, you cannot feel empathy and dehumanize at the same time. <laughs> okay. That makes uh, perfect sense to me. Well, I, f I find it uh, interesting, of course, that the, uh, the this mediation tournament was held in uh, in Tbilisi in Georgia because, of course, um, the Nagorno-Karabakh region has come under a lot of focus lately. And between Georgia and, and Azerbaijan, uh, the conflicts that are, that are happening there as we speak. Uh, but also, we can add to that list uh, Israel-Palestine. But also, we can add, I'm sure, Greece and Turkey, not something that is immediately at uh, any kind of armed conflict, but there are tensions there. And, and there are many other countries that, that have tensions. So going back to this topic about mediation, how important is it to, to talk about rehumanization when we are talking at the state level? Mediation is very important, not just for interpersonal relations. I mean, uh, the legal, it was a law school tournament. So basically it would be mediation between parts in a civil dispute, but mediation principles are there for international uh, disputes and for a situation between countries, as you mentioned them. Uh, and we could all learn. It's, it's the same, uh, actually, principles that apply. And, you know, for example, the Sinai example between Egypt and, um, and Israel was a very good example of how mediation principles could apply because at the end of the day, it was not the positions, but the interests of the two countries that were uh, served with, uh, with agreeing uh, on the Sinai. And it showed that if you apply the mediation principles, which means let's look at each other as you know, equal parts of, of in, inside a problem, and let's see not at our positions, but at our interests. So if your interest, and at that case in Sinai, it was quite uh, evident that for Israel, the interest was to be able to have peace. It was not the piece of land, but it was the peace that it wanted. So it all ended up with an accord, with, with a situation that served both sides. Now, can we use this in, uh, in disputes generally? Yes. Will it work? It depends. It depends on the political leadership that exists in every country at a certain time. It exists on the level of the conflict. There are many issues. If we're talking now, I mean, I think that the, the contemporary issue now of discussion is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at the dynamic it has. You know, it's, it's the situation where definitely we need rehumanization. We need sides to understand that the other side is also human. Uh, but there are also other parameters to be taken into account. So, for example, if you have two parts that agree uh, and they, you know, apply the principles of rehumanization and they try to reach one another and they try to reach a viable solution, the problem that usually arises uh, is what happens with groups in both sides that are on the extreme and will carry out definitely an act that will endanger the accord, that will endanger the, um, the agreement. 
And I think that uh, also in mediation, one of the things that we try to take into account when as mediators we are trying to help the two parts reach uh, an agreement is trying to see whether in every side there are other people, other entities that will jeopardize the agreement, that will jeopardize this empathy, this rehumanization, all the elements that went well in order to reach an agreement. And I think that the problem in most countries and if we're talking about international level, is this, that even if governments, even if the majority agrees and shows all the steps of rehumanization, blah, 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 what happens when there is even a small group inside them that will jeopardize this agreement, will carry out, let's say, a terror attack? Most, you know, I mean, we know in the past, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, whenever an agreement was uh, soon to be reached, uh, an attack took place. And it it could take place also from the Israeli side or from the Palestinian side, it didn't matter. Well, I find it very interesting when we when we're talking a bit about dehumanization today that we can be talking about a level as large as uh, Nazi Germany and the Holocaust and the horrible crimes that happened there, but we could be talking about something very very small scale like a, a man hitting his wife uh, who's unable to report it. And when we talk about rehumanization, we're talking about a similar solution or a similar principle of equality that we can apply in both cases, obviously, at, at a bigger or larger scale. But I think one interesting thing that we've seen last year with COVID-19 and the pandemic is that it has shown the entire world the fragility of humans and the commonality of humans. This virus can affect any of us and has has devastated all of us in different ways. And I think this is very interesting. This, this pandemic that is horrible as it is, has also maybe shown us how similar we are uh, as a species. And so my last question for you today, Maria, is this experience that we have had of the pandemic, will it be a rehumanizing action? And can we see a more human tomorrow after this? I'm an optimist and a pessimist at the same time. Uh, I am a doctor of science, but a woman of faith. So as a woman of faith, as a Christian, uh, I always have this optimistic uh, belief and a belief uh, in the good of humanity. However, <laughs> as a person of science and watching what is going on around me. I have to say that this pandemic has shown, yes, as you said before, the fragility of all, how we are all susceptible to this virus, but at the same time, it showed how still there is injustice and also still in the pursuit of, um, let's say, health and fighting this virus, uh, there are divisions. Um, For example, uh, what will happen to the countries that are poor and don't have access to vaccines? Are we heading into uh, societies in the world with privileged who have access to health and continents that will not because they are poor? I'm not that optimistic that we woke up because of this pandemic. This pandemic, on the contrary, has shown to us, um, well, it has shown reality, all the problems that we face because of our behavior. Um, No, I don't see us waking up. Uh, Again, the, the vaccine issue and... The whole talk, the whole debate about the medical costs and how this access to therapy for some countries uh, and its people who are poor is a problem, is still a problem, um, for me shows that we have not learned our lesson. And we have not learned our lesson when there are some, you know, guesses that, you know, after COVID-19, other distractions and challenges, even from an environmental point of view, could could face the earth. And the question is, are we ready to face them? And are we ready to overcome it? Or will it be an issue again for those who are privileged, who were lucky enough to be born in Europe, who were lucky to be born in certain, let's say, racial, ethnic groups, and others will stay outside of the solution? Well, certainly more questions than answers, but I want to thank you for raising these very important questions, and uh, that will unfortunately conclude our conversation today. Thank you very much for your invitation. A big thank you to your listeners. I very much hope that we can get around to answering or trying to answer some of these questions for our next episode. But for now, Dr. Marie Alvenu, thank you so much for your time, your thoughts, your consideration and your cutting commentary. And uh, I certainly hope to have you on the show again.
and I hope you'll stay with us for the next episodes that we've got planned. Please remember to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and more. And of course, to check out our website for the latest episodes. Thank you so much and have a great day.